chapter 2 of the Gita, Virgilius now scolds Dante and calls him out, calls out his manhood, right? If you remember how Krishna calls out Arjuna. So Virgilius says to Dante, if I had well thy language understood, replied that shade of the magnanimous, thou soul attainted is with cowardice, which many times a man encumbers so. It turns him back from honored enterprise, as false sight doth a beast. Die. That thou may freest thee from this apprehension, I'll tell thee why I came and what I heard at the first moment when I grieve for thee. So this Virgilius came to Dante when he was running down the mountain, but he came at the request of a celestial being named Beatrice, a heavenly um, celestial being. And she came down to tell this Virgilius, please be his guide, because she has a special uh, love for him or concern for his well-being. So this is how she asked Virgilius. Her eyes were shining brighter than the star, and she began to say, gentle and low, with a voice angelic in her own language, a friend of mine, and not the friend of fortune, upon the desert slope is so impeded upon his way that he has turned through terror, and may I fear already be so lost that I too late have risen to his succor from that which I had heard of him in heaven. Bestir thee now, and with thy speech ornate, and what, what is needful for his release, assist him so that I may be consoled. Virgilius now picks up the dialogue. And unto thee I came as she desired. I have delivered thee from that wild beast which barred the beautiful mountain's short ascent. What is it then? Why, do, why dost thou delay? Why is such baseness beheaded in thy heart? Daring and hardihood, why hast thou now? Seeing that three such ladies, Benedict, are caring for thee in the court of heaven, and so much good my speech doth promise thee. So after hearing from Virgilius that Dante has three beautiful and compassionate celestial beings, ensuring his projection in the heavenly realms, Dante describes what to me in the yoga scriptures sound like the awakening of the chakras. And he makes what I consider one of the most important characteristics, uh, characteristic statements in spiritual life. And so Dante says, even as the flowerets by nocturnal chill bow down and closed when the sun whitens them, uplift themselves and open on them. Darker. Such I became with my exhausted strength and such good courage to my heart there coursed that I began like an intrepid person. O oh, she compassionate who succored me and courteous thou who has obeyed so soon the works of him which the words of truth which he addressed to thee, thou hast my heart with desire disposed to the adventure, but these words of thine, that to my first intent I have returned. Then says now, he says to the master, now go, for one soul will is in us both, thou leader and thou Lord and master thou, thus I said to him. And when he had moved, I entered on the deep and savage way. Part for that. So at this point, they descend, and this is one of the drawings done by Gustave Dore. Um, also, uh, it's in the public domain because it was done so long ago. But you can see the two 
characters getting ready to descend into the hell, the world of the punishment. At the lowest level, Dante will see the representation of the incarnation of the totality of evil. And this is the point where all the evils in the world are converging to and they return. And then after seeing this, and I won't tell you what it is. If you want, you have to go read the description. Yourself. I don't want to spoil it. It's, it's, it's a little different than what you think, actually. And Dante's reaction to it, too, was a little different. I was surprised. But then the journey begins upward again. The guide and I into that hidden road now entered to return to the bright world. And without care of having any rest, we mounted up, he first and I the second, till I beheld through a round aperture some of the beauteous things that heaven doth bear. So now we come, that was only a very short excerpt of the Purgatorio. Very, very short, just uh, a couple of cantos actually, but it gives hopefully some of the flavor. Um, we're going to now come to the second book which is the Purgatorio. This is the world of purging and cleansing. And of that second kingdom I will sing, wherein the human spirit doth purge itself and to ascend to heaven become worthy. So this Purgatory too has 33 cantos and we'll only have time to sample a few verses because we have to get to the final book of the trilogy, which is really the verses on universal oneness, which really I connected with my background in Vedanta. So for the second book, I'm just going to uh, give you a couple of verses and then give you a couple of the titles of some of the cantos so you can see. Um, so the first verse, kind of interesting. This is part of the discourse on the limits of reasoning, which Virgil gives to Dante. So as they're going through, there's no shadow falling there. Dante is confused. Why am I not seeing shadow? So the language goes, now if in front of me no shadow fall, marvel not at it more than the heavens, because one ray impedeth not another. Starting to talk about harmony here. Harmony with each other. You suffer torments, both of heat and cold, cold and heat, bodies like this, that power provides, which wills that how it works not be unveiled to us. So the mystery of the creator. And then the last line, which is the most important, I think, of this particular. Insane is he who hopeth that our reason can transverse, can transverse the illimitable way. And Vedanta says that too. Cannot get there through logic after truth. And even the intellect, as Swami Chin earlier in the. Okay. So next we have. It. Okay. So some of the titles of the Purgatorio um, Discourse on the Limits of Reason, um, The Nature of the Mountain. Um, the negligent, those who postpone repentance or spiritual practice to late in life, the valley of flowers, and then they come to the first circle, which is called the proud. So the first thing we have to do is to eliminate our pride, our ego. Same team. Good. Free of ego, self center. Second, uh, the second circle, as they're going up with this, and a purging, is the envious. We have to get rid of our jealousy, right? If we're jealous of other people, that will ever be an obstacle in during it. So we get rid of the, the, the next one is the denunciation of stubbornness, which again is stubbornness, is personal bias or ego. The third circle is the irascible, those who are easily irritated, um, that are easily provoked into argumentation overcome that. The fourth is the slotful, those who don't do the meditation when they should or do the spiritual practices because they'd rather do it. Um, then is the dis uh, Virgil gives a discourse on love and free will. And then at the fifth circle is the avaricious and the prodigal. Then the next circle is the gluttonous and the, the discussion on the mystical tree. Um, and then they come to the seventh circle, the wanton, 
then the last uh, is the tree of knowledge and the allegory of the chariot. And of course, um, there's also an allegory of the chariot and well. So I'll give you two more verses and then we'll move on to the Paradiso. So one verse here, Canto 4, whenever by delight or else by pain, that seizes any faculty of ours, holy to that the soul collects it. It seemeth no other power it heeds. And against this, that error is which thinks one soul above another kindles in us. And hence, whenever aught is seen or heard, which keeps the soul intently bent upon it, time passes on and we perceive it not. And so both of these teachings are there in, in Swami Vivekananda's Raja Yoga for sure. Right? We know how easy if we have a toothache or stomach ache and then go try to sit for your meditation, mind wants to go there. Right? Even just overeat and go sit for meditation. Sensation in the stomach. Uh, prescribes sparing diet and meditate for breakfast. And also, whenever anything ought or seen, which keeps the soul intently bent upon it, time passes on and we believe it not. And Swami Vivekananda gives that example. If we're engrossed in reading a book or something, here necessarily the chime clock in the So whenever we're focused on something, we start to go beyond time. We don't perceive the. And then the Canto Five. I, I, I thought this was a nice Canto. Um, what it happens is they're they're going up this mountain of purging, and they come across a, a group of these other shades, these other shadows, or people that are also going through the same purging. And one of them decides to yell at Dan, Dante. Yell at Dante. So Dante replies. Mine eyes I turned to utterances of these words, and I saw them watching with astonishment, but me, but me, and the light which was broken. And then the master, Vigilius, says to him, Why doth thy mind so occupy itself, the master said, that thou thy pace has thus slackened? What matters it to thee, what here is whispered? Come after me and let the people talk. Stand like a steadfast tower that never wags its top for all the blowing of the winds. Forevermore the man in whom is springing thought upon thought removes him from the mark because the force of the one weakens the other. Again, we should not be letting our meditation occupied by things that are said about us. And in, um, In Song, in Song of the Sannyasin, Swami Vivekananda actually put something very similar. As, Let put, one put garlands on, another kick this frame, say not. No praise or blame can be where praise or blamed, blamer, blamed, blamer blamed, or one. Thus be thou come, Sannyasin, bold. So that's the same teaching Dante got from his master. Don't let the opinion of the others. So that's just a sample of some of the purgings um, during the second book of the trilogy. Now we'll come into the final, the Paradiso. See, in the Western traditions, the idea of heaven singing celestial beings in harp music. 
So I, I had this piece that I did for that. There's an interesting um, side story here that the uh, composer Liszt, who I mentioned at the start of the talk, who did his 55-minute uh, uh, symphony on this, he first ended his symphony with a loud, clashing, triumphant playing of the orchestra. But then the, um, the, another big name at the time, Wagner, um, heard it and he says, no, 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 no. That's the wrong way to enter this. You should enter it softly with harps and singing. So he actually did change his to include a choir and um, music similar to what we just listened. But now here we are, and we're going to go through the nine upper layers, and I'm going to select, I selected some of those verses which I feel build up to this idea of Vedantic oneness. And so as we begin this Paradiso, um, we know too that at the insistence of his devotees, Ramakrishna made many attempts to explain what happens to his consciousness after it rises to a certain level. But despite repeated requests and dis, um, repeated attempts, that look goes beyond a certain point and I cannot explain it any further. And so the Paradiso opens with sort of the same idea. He says, Dante now, the glory of him who moveth everything doth penetrate the universe and shine in one part more and in another less. Within that heaven which most his light receives was I, and things beheld to which repeat nor knows nor can, who from above descends. Because in drawing near to its desire, our intellect engulfs itself so far that after it the memory cannot go. Truly whatever of the holy realm I had the power to treasure in my mind shall now become the subject of my own. O power divine, Lentst thou thyself to me, so that the shadow of the blessed realm, stamped in my brain, I can make manifest. So then his first glance in the heavenly realm was so intense that he wrote the following. Not long I bore it, nor so little while, but I beheld it sparkle round about, like iron that comes from molten from the fire. Suddenly, it seemed that day to day was added, as if he who has the power had with another son the heaven adored. I read that and I said, oh, wow, isn't that familiar? Right? We have in Vedanta the light of, the light of a thousand suns. Revelation, the light of a thousand suns. And here he puts it. It seemed that day to day was added. You can imagine greater adding a son each day, right? It was added as if he who has the power had with another son the heaven. Oh, that was a beautiful expression of it. And so we have this, the brilliant as the light of a thousand. And now he's being accompanied by Beatrice. Um, remember I had told you that his original guide, Virgilius, could only take him so far. Now he's going with Beatrice which in real life he met as a nine-year-old girl. He saw a vision of her on the balcony somewhere, wanted to meet her his whole life. And then he met her a little bit when they were, maybe were 20 years old. And then shortly after that, she died. But he was her, uh, she was his thought after desire through his whole life. They say part of this um, may have been visiting, revisiting of, that memory of her. So he named her in this as his final guide that took him to the universal oneness. And so along the way, they meet very uh, uh, sorted uh, ver uh, celestial beings uh, in the heaven, and he gets caught up in a conversation, one of them, one of them. And so in Swami Vivekananda's Raja Yoga, he says, the yogi shall not feel allured or flattered by the overture of celestial beings or the fear of evil again. There are other dangers too. Gods and other beings come to tempt the yogi. They do not want anyone to be perfectly free. They are jealous just as we are and worse than us sometimes. They are very much afraid of losing their places. Those yogis who do not reach perfection die and become gods. Leaving the direct road, they go into one of the side streets and get these powers. 
Now, where did we hear that phrase before, leaving the direct road? Well, we heard it back earlier in the talk, right? Where Dante says, Midway through the, upon the journey of our life, I found myself within the forest dark, where the straightforward pathway had been lost. So Swami Vivekananda too says, we should not be flattered by the overture of celestial beings. So returning to Dante now, we listen to his guide, Beatrice, as she speaks. And she began, thou makest thyself so dull with false imagining that thou seest not what thou wouldst see if thou hadst shaken it off. All things, whatever they be, have order among themselves, and this is form. That makes the universe resemble God. Here do the higher creatures see the footprints of the eternal power, which in the end, whereto is made the law already mentioned. In the order that I speak of are inclined all natures, by their destinies diverse, more or less near unto their origin. Hence they move onward unto ports diverse over the great sea of being, and each one with instinct given it, which bears it on. This bears away the fire towards the moon, this in mortal hearts, the motive power, this binds together and unites the earth. And a little later it comes on, and they start beginning to see, we're going higher and higher, remember, and, and things are becoming more ethereal. There's less um, tangible things and coming light. And so Dante starts to describe his experiences with the eternal light. The eyes beloved and revered of God fastened upon the speaker showed to us how grateful unto her our prayers devout. Then unto the eternal light they turned on which it is not credible could be by any creature bent I so clear. And I, who to the end of all desires was now approaching, even as I ought the ardor of desire within me. Bernard was reckon, beckoning me unto me and smiling that I should look upward, but I already was of my own accord, such as he wished. Because my sight, becoming purified, was entering more and more into the ray of the high light, which of itself is true. From that time forward, what I saw was greater than our discourse, that to such vision yields, and yields the memory unto such excess. Even as he is who seeth in a dream, and after dreaming the imprisoned passion remains, and to his mind the rest turns not. Even such am I, for almost utterly ceases my vision and distilleth within my heart the sweetness born from me. Here his sense of seeing now is failing. We're going beyond the sense. And what he's interpreting now is from his heart. You could say feeling is taking over than um, senses. And he goes on to write, O light supreme that dost so far uplift thee from the conceits of mortals, to my mind of, the, of what thou didst reappear, relend a little, and make of my tongue so great quiescence that but a single spark of thy glory it may bequeath unto to the future people. For by returning to my memory somewhat, and by a little sounding in these verses, more of thy victory shall be conceived. I think the keenness of the living ray, which I endured, would have bewildered me if but mine eyes had been averted from it. And I remember that I was more bold on this account to bear, so that I joined my aspect with the glory infinite. O grace abundant, by which I presumed to fix my sight on the upon the eternal light, so that the seeing I consumed therein. I saw that in its depth far down below is lying, bound up with love together in one volume, what through the universe in leaves is scattered. I love this picture because if you think, if we look without realizing universal oneness, 
things look like they're disparate activities in one part of the city or one part of the country or the uh, they all seem disjoint right we don't see from ordinary human human aspect all of the oneness that it's all related somehow that beyond our ordinary reasoning but he says here i saw that in its depth he's looking into the light now Saw that in its depth far down is lying, bound up with love together in one volume, what through the universe in leaves is scattered. You can imagine if you take a book and rip off the binding and just take all the loose pages and scatter them, they all separate. But binder, binding of the book, keep all of those pages together. So, and he's saying this binding is love. Substance and accident and their operations all interfuse together in such wise that what I speak of is one simple light. The universal fashion of this knot methinks I saw, since more abundantly in saying this, I feel that I rejoice. My mind in this wise, holy in suspense, steadfast, immovable, attentive, gazed, nevermore with gazing grew and kindled. In the presence of that life, one in, in the presence of that light, one such becomes that to withdraw therefrom for other prospect, it is impossible ere he consent. We hear this too in the yoga that most people who attain to that highest level from there do not return. You selected beings that reach that high level of. Um, the vision of the universal oneness, destined to be the teachers of human beings, return of their own will with a message. They come back to be of us. But he's saying here too, and I'm pretty sure that <clears throat> this has that same corollary. In the presence of that light, one such becomes that to withdraw therefrom for other prospect, it is impossible ere he can. But once you see it, you're destined. Don't come. And then we have a few verses now. Sort of here afterwards, my language will fall of what I yet remember that an infant who still his tongue doth moisten at the breast. So he's been. Press what? From there. Not because more than one unmingled semblance was in the living light on which I looked, for it is always what it was before. Transcendent, being in the Upanishad, change. But through the sight that fortified itself in me by looking, one appearance only to me was ever changing as I changed. Oh, how all speech is feeble and falls short of my conceit. And this to what I saw as such, is not enough, call it little. O light eternal soul, in thyself thou dwellest. Soul knowest thyself, and known unto thyself, and knowing lovest and smilest on thyself. I think up there I have one more to start with. Including thoughts. But, um, I like this verse too. I decided to use one of the images for this. This is where he talks about the sparkling of the spirit and how suddenly and incandescent it became unto his eyes that vanquished. He just couldn't take it. So blinded him. But then to uplift themselves, mine eyes resumed the power and I beheld myself translated to the higher salvation to which my lady, with my lady only. And they're looking, you can see they're looking up into that light um, which we've just heard some descriptions of. And this actually comes from the Purgatorio, but I thought it, it, it expressed a sentiment of um, universal forgiveness. Horrible my Inequities had been, but infinite goodness hath such ample arms that it receives whatever turns. 
the teaching here would be no matter what your background, no matter what, if you turn to God with sincerity, you make the effort, will love. This one, so with that, I'll just do the credits. Roll in the background, do the announcements for next week. Swami Vivekan, uh, Swami Yogamananda, sorry, um, is currently on a tour of South America in Argentina and Brazil. So the rest of April, this continues on with our guest speaker series. This coming Tuesday, the class of Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna will be given by Abhijit Sakar, and the following Tuesday will be given by Professor Suklian. Next week, the talk will be given by Rabbi Harry Dolinger of the Congregation Beth Shalom. His topic will be reincarnation in the Kabbalah. And um, on Saturday, April 27th, there's an upcoming spiritual retreat with um, Swami Atmayana Nanda, the resident minister of Washington, D.C. Um, his topic is poems of Swami Vivekananda. The registration is ongoing for that retreat now. You can register on our webpage, and um, you can also register in person with Naomi if you choose to do so. Um, so that's it. We will conclude with um, the congregational prayer. May the divine who is father in heaven of the Christians, holy one of the Jewish faith, Allah of the Muslims, Buddha of the Buddhists, Tao of the Taoists, great spirit of the Native Americans, Ahurmazda of the Zoroastrians, and Brahman of the Hindus, lead us from the unreal to the real, from death to from darkness to light, from death to immortality. May the all-loving being manifest himself unto us, grant us abiding understanding and all-consuming divine love. Peace, peace, peace unto all. After the RT, you are invited all to supper, which will be announced at